Hello there, my fellow old world travelers, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today we shall expand our famous Warhammer City series with the addition of another important settlement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the great city port of Marienburg. First and foremost, I would like to apologize in advance to all my Dutch viewers. Why the Dutch? Well, because Marienburg is heavily inspired by the mercantile organization of late medieval Dutch cities. Or the Netherlands, if you will. And I will inevitably butcher some of those words. That being said, I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Marienburg is the greatest trading hub in the old world, and also the greatest of its ports. Straddling the mouth of the river Reich as it drains the mainland into the Sea of Claus, nearly all maritime trade in Bretonia and the Empire happens right here. It is also a place despised by the Empire, despite, ironically, the fact that most of its sea trade happens right here. Marienburg is a city of islands, bridges and canals. When travelers arrive here, usually from the sea or after sailing through the fens of the Reich, the first thing that strikes them is how it rises out of the water like a behemoth, safe behind its massive wall called the Vlodmur, unconcerned with anything around it. The second thing that strikes them is how crowded all the islands are, with every inch taken up by residences, shops, warehouses, even on the bridges. The third and final thing that strikes any newcomer is the need for a large parasol when traveling the canals, under the bridges or beneath the overhanging windows. The islands of Marienburg are the remnants of the land upon which stood the ancient sea elf port city of, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce this, but it does translate into Fortress of the Star Gem on the sandy coast. The Vlodmur itself follows the outline of the old elven fortress wall. By the time humans arrived, nothing but broken ruins were left on the surface, though their foundations provided a base for future building. Just why the islands remained above the water while the swamp swallowed so much of the surrounding land is a mystery. Although the scholars of the College of Navigation and Sea Magics have speculated that it may have something to do with elven high magic. Nowadays, most of the islands rise about 20 feet above the canals, although that's less than 10 feet at high tide. And the waters rise even higher during the greatest tides around the spring and autumn equinoxes. Goes without saying that flooding is a common issue here. Marienburg is so different from the rest of the world in its culture that it is unsurprising that their government is different as well. Ever since the passing of the barons of the Westerland, it has no royalty whatsoever. No princes or kings or dukes or barons to form a proper government. Needing something to describe themselves to others, the scholars of Baron Henrik's College of Navigation and Sea Magic recently coined the term democracy, meaning rule by the masses. No wonder the Empire hates them although I would imagine the Bretonians would hate them even more. The people of Marienburg are proud to say that they themselves make their laws, and they see themselves and their city as shining examples of how good things can be. Let each man have his say, let each man tend to their own business, and it will be clear sailing for all, according to a Wastelander proverb. Or at least that's how the Visitor's Bureau says it has to work. The truth, as always, is somewhere else, and it is far darker than even the population fail to realize. While the Marienburgers enjoy more social mobility than their imperial cousins, the city is dominated by a clique of the wealthiest of the wealthy, governing from the smoke-filled lounges of the export-import exchange room with no more regard for the common man than a kennel owner has for his dogs. While a haughty matriarch sips cold Norskan Akavit and stuffs herself with Kislevian caviar in Goodberg, families will starve in tiny rooms in the Sudok. And in between are all kinds of factions, people who gather together to protect people like themselves from people who aren't, all aiming to climb just one more step on the social ladder. Without a doubt, Marienburg is a very wealthy city. Money and goods flow through it in immense quantities each and every day, and everything about life in Marienburg encourages people to make more money, to make a deal, and to get rich quick. 
At the same time, layer after layer of government and guild laws stifled the creative businessman. So, being enterprising people, the Marienburgers turned to other means to get ahead. Mainly crime. The most common crime in Marienburg is, as you might expect for a port, smuggling. Almost everyone engages in it to some degree. From the seaman hiding a few baubles in the personal chest, to professionals like Donut Toursveld at the Red Cock Inn, and big time operators like Adalbert Casanova Henchman, and his Sudoc based empire. Sometimes they are simply avoiding the many taxes and tariffs imposed upon them by the city, engaging in a bit of free trade, as they say it. In others, however, smuggling is the only way to go, because the cargo itself is illegal. Drugs, stolen items, forbidden magic, or even people. Other kinds of crime are common, ranging from simple back alley robbery to arson, murder, and clandestine feuds among the Great Ten families. Swindlers are a dime a dozen, always looking for some new person in the city and therefore ripe for the picking. More than one visitor has bought a worthless deed or phantom cargo only to discover that a seller was nowhere to be found and pickpockets love the crowded dock. But of course, where there's crime, there's crime fighters. Several law enforcement agencies, public and private, have been set up in Marienburg over the centuries. Given the confusing mass of often contradictory local and citywide laws, jurisdictional conflicts arise between these agencies quite often, especially between the City Watch and the River Watch. Many a suspect has languished for days in a jail cell while these two sorted out what crime was either wet or dry. Surrounding the Marienburg like a mother hen sheltering her chicklets is the Great Wall of the Vlodmur. This is the main protection of the city against the dangers of flooding from the sea, and against the possibility of attack from any side. It runs for miles and miles around the perimeter of Marienburg built upon the foundations of the walls of the old elven fortress. But the directors have lavished the most money and attention at either end of the Reich, and at the important Ostenport and Westenport gates. Here, ramparts of stone and great round towers face the entrance to the Reich, known as the Stromport Gate. In times of emergency, officers in charge of the Stromport Towers can order the raising of a huge chain, which has been laid across the bottom of the channel. And within half an hour, a metal fence will block all entrance coming down the Reich. Cannons on the towers ensure that vessels trapped by the chains will not last long in there. At the opposite end, where the Manansport Zee begins, the entrance to Marienburg's harbor is primarily guarded by the fortress prison of Riker's Isle, and its cannon and fire hurling catapults. Here, the towers of the Vlodmur are smaller, and the walls are meant to shelter the harbors of Manan's Haven and Elftown, whose ships and marines are vital to the city defense. In between the Stromport and Riker's Isle, broken only by the imposing gatehouses of the Ostport and Westenport, the Vlodmur is more like a large dike, built of packed earth, stone and wood pilings, perpetually reinforced and rebuilt. Brick-lined tunnels pierce it at multiple points each built within the base of a stone watchtower. During times of dangerously high tides, residents near the walls can hear the rhythmic thrumming of the dwarf-built pumps, forcing water out into the swamp. Each end is guarded by twin metal portcullises to prevent entrance from the swamp, while the city lamplighters keep a regular patrol on the wooden palisade which tops the Vlodmur. Religion is a big part of everyday life in Marienburg pervading almost everything that Marienburgers do, think or say. They see the reality that the gods are all around them. When a priestess heals a dying child, it is because Shalia heard her prayer. When a ship carrying a loved one returns safely, it is because of Manan's protection. And when a merchant makes a small fortune on a single deal, it is because Hendrik favored him. Marienburgers perform small rituals with each act, almost unconsciously invoking a god's favor. A trader will spit on his palm before shaking hands on a deal, affirming to Renald that the business is clean. A mother will tie the first tooth to fall from her child's mouth in a bag and hang it on the child's bed to remind more of her baby's innocence and beg for his protection. 
organized religion and formal worship are important to Marienburgers as well. The census of 2500 IC listed 157 recognized places of worship here. From the great temples and cathedrals of the Tempelvik to small churches and shrines hidden down nearly every alley. And there are many more private shrines to gods and saints in homes, in businesses, in offices, in guilds, and even in boats. All this is not to say that wastelanders are religious fanatics. Their attitude towards their gods is just as pragmatic as the rest of their views. The high priest of Hendrik describes this as an attitude of religious commerce. I give the gods worship, and in return they give me what I need. Everyone wins in the end. And like other old worlders, they pray to whatever gods fits the circumstance. A lawyer on his way to court might stop at a shrine to Verena, but never to Moor. A docker playing dice at the Pelican's Perch would say a quick prayer to Renald, but not Shalia. While a Marienburger might have a favorite god, exclusive devotion is rare, and a thing only for saints and fanatics. Even priests will pray to other gods from time to time, sometimes even officiating the services of a different cult when no other priest is available. The calendar is filled to the brim with major and minor religious holidays, and the sight of a parade by some guild or other organization to honor their patron deity is quite common in Marienburg. And not just in honor of the old world gods either, for Marienburg is also home to large communities out of Araby, Nippon, Ind, and Cafe. And this, my fellow fantasy Netherlanders, has been what I wanted to tell you about the independent, prosperous, and unique city of Marienburg for today. Just like with Aldorf and Middenheim, and a couple of other great cities to follow in this series, this overview was only the beginning of the lore of Marienburg. Future topics, whenever we return to this city, will include its inhabitants, guilds, great families, law enforcement, interesting places, and much, much more. I do hope that today, at least you formed a picture of what Marienburg is all about. I look forward to reading your thoughts on it in the comments below. If you found this episode informative, please leave a like, share, and subscribe for future content. And use the bell notification icon to stay more up to date. Blessings of Sigmar and Manon be upon you.